There are reports that the Iranian regime is working out deals with Russia to deliver uranium as part of the Islamic Republic's ongoing weapons development program. Now, to talk about this frightening detail in more detail is our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, who joins us once again from Los Angeles. Lisa, this is a huge setback to the ongoing negotiations to revive the 2015 Iran nuclear agreement. Right. But this is not an argument in favor of the deal. This only illustrates what the regime is capable of doing, meaning if you really had an Iran regime that was looking to step away from its nuclear program to prove to the world that it will not be seeking a nuclear program, destruction of its enemies, the United States and Israel, uh, to continue pouring billions of dollars into terrorism, to continue its heinous crimes on its, civil its citizens back at home. Well, it it's, it's failing in all accounts. So when you look at this deal that they have struck with the Russians, it only proves that this is their journey. This is the way in which they're working. Um, they weren't forced into Russia's lap because of the um, Trump pulling out of the JCPOA or Biden's administration's failure to get back into a new G JCPOA. It only proves that this is the behavior of Iran's regime. So now they have struck a deal with Russia. This is exactly what we were fearful of, of happening. Russia, China, uh, Iran's regime, perhaps um, North Korea will join in the mix in some capacity. They are, are already selling um, weapons parts to Russia. Um, Venezuela, you can add to the list. So all the bad actors on the globe um, making nice with one another, cutting deals because they are limited in terms of trade partners and limited in terms of, of who they can engage with. So um, Russia will now be sending uranium to Tehran as part of this deal. This is what this this the, the, the latest report alleges. Um, and we know that Iran is selling its drones and other um, military equipment, perhaps, to Russia that has already been used in Ukraine. So this seems like a very reciprocal relationship, and um, it's it's moving in the direction of, of, a, of a lot of weaponry being used in that part of the world. Now, according to a watchdog group, Iran could potentially produce enough weapons-grade material to power a nuclear bomb in just 12 days. And the report also suggests that Iran could produce another four bombs within a month's time. Right. So, you know, there's so many reports coming out right now. One says nine days, one says 12 days, one says one month. Uh, and the number of, of weapons, I mean, it looks as though they either have the bomb already, they're very close to having it, or they will have it very soon. Um, and, you know, again, what is the, the what is the global community? When I say that, it's the United States and the Western nations um, as, as a community. What what do they think about these reports? I mean, what are, what are we doing about them? I mean, when you have the European Union twiddling its thumbs and deciding whether or not to put the Revolutionary Guard, that's the paramilitary arm of Iran's regime, on the, the terror list, um, and here you have reports of them actually having or being very close to having nuclear uh, weapons capability. I mean, there's some sort of disconnect here, right? So either the Western world is not taking these reports seriously enough or they don't mind Iran having a nuclear weapon uh, or they're just letting them buy out the time and buy, you know, play out the clock as, as Iran's regime is doing so well. So it just doesn't add up. Of course, uh, how the reports that you're um, pointing to are extremely worrisome in the sense that Iran's regime not only is very close to having a, a nuclear weapon, they want to have the nuclear weapon, they are isolated from the world, they're flexing their muscles, and then, you know, the, the rest is, is, is really up to our imaginations as to what can happen. And obviously right now the revolution continues in Iran, but Lisa, now we're hearing reports that dozens of Iranian schoolgirls were hospitalized in what the government calls a series of mysterious suspected poisonings. Yes. So now they're going after these young girls. Um, you know, th this this is horrific. Uh, there were th a decent number of, of media reports in the mainstream media about this, thankfully, a little too late because this happened a, a few days back. Uh, and we're still not hearing anything from, again, the powers that be, meaning what sort of repercussion will this have uh, when these young girls are being poisoned? Of course, this being um, this symbolic, you know, um, slap on the wrist and, and, and punishment for these girls uh, because they are, again, partaking in protests, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of 
carrying on this um this this revolution for over five months now so um these young girls are the absolute symbol of this revolution this revolution is it's not just a feminist movement of course it's it's across iran all people um, of all ages saying enough is enough they're asking for regime change but of course the symbol of this movement being the 22 year old girl massa amini who was killed beaten to death because she was wearing improper islamic headscarf uh and and died in, in custody um after her beating. So, of course, that being the symbol of this, the women of Iran leading the charge, you know, being the symbol and, and icons of this revolution. So the regime uh, targeting them and poisoning them is no surprise. But again, where where are the consequences? Where's the international community? Where are the women? Where's the Me Too movement? Where are the, the Women's March um, participants and leaders? Where are they? And why aren't they speaking out about these young women being poisoned merely for speaking out? These are young school-aged girls. Lisa, according to a report by NGO Monitor, a Palestinian nonprofit group received $78,000 from the U.S. Agency for International Development despite ties to terror groups. That has to be quite concerning. Yes, this is U.S. aid. These are our, our uh, tax dollars at work, right? Imagine American people, and I'm sure uh, Canadians as well, hardworking people, you know, being taxed uh, on what they work for and then giving that money to groups that are supporting terrorism. It happens all the time. I know, um, you know, it, when it does happen, we point it out and say, why aren't we more careful about this? Um, this was a Palestinian NGO. This is a, a, a nonprofit organization. Um, so many of these groups kind of mask themselves as humanitarian groups, but then are obviously very either sympathetic to or funding uh, groups that are involved in terrorism. This is exactly one of those cases. Uh, the Trump administration was very keen on pointing out a lot of the money that was going towards these Palestinian groups and then was being used for the pay to, to slay programs that is giving money to uh, families of suicide bombers and others who are considered martyrs um, in the in the Palestinian world. Um, the, he stopped a lot of that, but the Biden administration reinstated a lot of that aid. U.S. aid, of course, giving money to a lot of these different organizations, but not doing the vetting that needs to be done. And uh, we hope that these kinds of reports and exposés do shine a light on uh, these groups and um, really underscore the importance of, of vetting them before giving out that money. A former American soldier was sentenced to 45 years in prison last week for planning a jihadist attack on his fellow soldiers in his army unit. Now, Lisa, a release from the Justice Department says 24-year-old Ethan Meltzer from Kentucky pleaded guilty to trying to murder U.S. service members? Yeah, an inside job. Um, this is, it's its horrific. But, you know, this goes back to the see something, say something um, kind of age. I think we've, we've, we've stepped away from that a bit in terms of, of being politically correct and not calling anybody out and, and being more quote unquote tolerant. Um, you know, if you, you know, if, if you see something different or, you know, behavioral changes, you want people to report that and see that this could have been a horrific uh, incident inside the military. Imagine sending your young uh, son, daughter off to fight for the country and then having something like this happen from the inside. Look, um, this can be blamed on psychological issues or some, or, or, or worse, you know, kind of um, sabotage from the inside uh, or infiltration uh, in, in some cases. But um, again, very important that this was foiled, that it was caught, and um, he's made an example of so that they take a very uh, a closer look at vetting and looking at uh, different um, incidents within the, the military. You know, social media can be toxic at the best of times. Well, now a recent report found that a high-profile United Nations human rights official's social media account was allegedly full of anti-Semitic posts. So let me ask you something. How can the UN remain objective when it comes to dealing with the Israel-Palestine conflict when we hear stories like this? Yeah, it, the UN has never been unbiased towards Israel. We know that, right? Because we we see them putting uh, countries like Saudi Arabia and Cuba and Iran's regime at the helm of of women's rights organizations. I mean, I talk about opposite day at the UN. That's every day at the UN. And then um, you know, uh, coming up with these reports and uh, investigations on Israel and their human rights. Uh, and you know, when you look at a country like Israel, the only democratic country in the Middle East uh, that uh, has a gay pride parade every year and uh, more women in um, universities than men. Uh, we've had women prime ministers, women in the parliament, uh, women treated 
beyond equally um, in, in their government. So um, it, it's crazy to think that every day at the UN, this, this truth about a nation like Israel is kind of brushed away. And, it, you know, all of these so-called human rights abuses that are trumped up charges against Israel are brought to the forefront when countries like, again, Saudi Arabia and Iran's regime and uh, Syria and Cuba, all of the, those countries are for, not only forgiven, but honored and given such a a, 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 a platform uh, to come spew their, their garbage. So this it's not uh, any surprise that this individual was working for the assistant secretary of, of humanitarian um, group within the UN and of course his social media being full of awful horrific things about Israel and about the Jews um you know we live in a day and age this is crazy how when you see so much of this Jew hatred um we live in a day and age where no hatred is tolerated nothing negative is tolerated you know if you talk about someone's weight it's called fat shaming if you talk about the way someone looks i mean it's sexist if you 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 can't say anything negative about anybody and we're trying to promote that for our children for everyone in the workplace etc and yet you see such a, a a professional spewing so much hatred i mean regardless of, of which group it is tar it's targeting why so much hatred when you're working uh at, at a place like the united nations or anywhere else in any professional capacity you're, we're seeing teachers that are anti-Semitic, professors that are anti-Semitic. We're seeing CEOs. Um, and of course, now this case at the UN, which was highlighted at the, at the foreign desk. And I, and I thank you, Ha, for bringing attention to it. So, I mean, there has to be more attention paid to all forms of hatred, but specifically anti-Semitism, which is on the rise. What our parents used to tell us as well, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Lisa, the World Health Organization is urging all countries to reveal what they know about the origins of COVID-19 after claims from the U.S. government agencies that a Chinese lab leak was behind the disease and they were denied by Beijing. It only took three years, Hal. It only took three years to actually ask for transparency. I mean, there was a report this week we had at the foreign desk where uh, it looks as, as though Anthony Fauci allegedly um, canceled a lot of these reports, a lot of these investigations, and he asked for certain narratives to be written up. Um, we see the same thing from the World Health Organization. We saw the same thing from, from, from so many different groups, places of work, schools, places of worship. Um, you know, uh, athletes being denied access to the game because they weren't vaccinated. And then, you know, not being able to question. That is that is what was so horrific about that time. And now so many people being exonerated uh, be because of that. But so many lives lost senselessly because we weren't able to get to the bottom of this, to get to the bottom of what medications may work, to get to the bottom of what this vaccine is, what what harmful effects it has. And really, where this that where this virus came from? There are people that are were working in the U.S. government, actual elected officials who were defending China's government over Donald Trump. I mean, when you get to a place where, regardless of your political beliefs, you cannot defend your country, regardless of who is at the helm, you cannot defend your country over an enemy state. In that case, it's an enemy state. They're trying to uh, purposely leak viruses and, 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 and engage in bio warfare. Um, we have to look at them and, and ask for this transparency and ask for the truth. And so many people did it. Not, not only did they not, they helped in covering it up. And I'm talking about social media companies and the government and groups like the World Health Organization, individuals like Anthony Fauci. And that's where we are at today, three years later. Wow. You know, some of the water cooler chat right here at the television station is about the Jesus Revolution, how well the movie's doing right now. The revival's taking place, Asbury, Kentucky, and a 22 other post-secondary campuses across the United States. But now, Lisa, school advocates across the U.S. are warning about satanic after-school clubs that are apparently forming. Many are concerned about the impact the satanic temple's efforts will have on our young people and their view of faith. How could school boards even allow this to happen? This is this is crazy, right, Al? Because you're living in a time where we are so concerned as parents of, of, of children of all ages, whether they're in preschool or in college, we're all concerned about the indoctrination at school. Um, and we all know that pr particularly at, uh, at at public schools, how um, that really there, there, that separation of church and state has never been uh, as as separated, meaning um, they question, you know, if you say God bless you to somebody, they look at you and say, ah, oh, it's interesting that you invoked God. 
I just sneezed, right? <laughs> uh, so we're we're living in a time where you know um, all all aspects of that Judeo Christian culture that was so much a part of Western culture has really been extracted from our daily lives, particularly at schools and in, in public places. Now imagine in in lieu of that, now they are bringing in this satanic um, you know influence. When children are not exposed to church or synagogue or mosque or whatever you you worship, and then all of a sudden their blank canvases are exposed to the satanic temple, maybe this is what they will pick up, right? It's unfair to say we're going to strip them of 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 the culture of our of our world, which is again this Judeo Christian these underpinnings. It's our history. It's our. It's in fact our history, and to now give them you know the the alternative uh, without having both sides. That's what I think is very much unfair because you can advocate for freedom of speech and and learning different things and children should be exposed to different things. But really, you know, this is the issue many of us have with with a lot of the you know the the sex ed at at, at different ages. I mean, you really have to meet children at where they're at uh, and what they're ready for. Uh, so it's unfair to not teach you know certain things and then to again allow the children to be exposed to so much of this uh, without the parents knowing in many cases how I think a lot of parents have that issue I mean if, if parents had a choice to be able to prepare their children and again a lot of parents not having that time or not having the time with their children or not knowing what's going on at school not having access to that curriculum or that information they won't be able to combat it at home so um, this is what we've been covering a lot of this education stuff at the foreign desk you know we do national security and we feel like you know advocating for our children is part of our national security right now and this of course being a very important story and, and part of that. Political reporter and foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari, thanks so much for joining us today from Los Angeles, California. My pleasure. Thank you.